This is our second sermon in this series, Dirty Jobs. 82% of Americans say, I hate my job. 70% say that their most dreaded day of the week is Monday. And there are some people who view their jobs as dirty jobs. And all they do is endure all through the week, just waiting for the weekend. There are people that dream for early retirement. Now, we spend half our waking hours on the job. And I think we would have a good lesson to see how God views that, that the God of Sundays is the God of Monday through Saturday. And you think about Jesus, and he talked about how we are to live our lives and being on the job as part of that. Last week we started this series talking about job stress, and we're going to illustrate that just with a visual reminder of that. And on any job, on any job, there's going to be job stress, even if you have the most perfect job. You're going to have episodes of stress in your life. Jesus probably, well, Jesus had perfect job performance, didn't he? But they still crucified him. So there's going to be some level of stress. Today we're going to talk about excelling on the job and what it means to be on the job and to be a Christian. And before we do that, I'd like to go to the Lord of the Lord. Father, I pray that you would anoint this time together, that you would anoint this entire worship experience from beginning to end of the day. And I pray, Father, that you would let me be of mind to be able to communicate the words that you've laid on my heart to the church. And I pray, oh God, that you would have us each individually hear what you would have us to hear as we are involved with different jobs, different tasks that we do day in, day out. And I pray, Father, that you could show us our purpose in that, that you could show us your purpose and our purpose together in that. And I want to echo the words of Jason with the fires encroaching upon uh, people's lives that we know about in nearby communities that you would bless and keep safe those people that you would protect and somehow divert and all the people involved with fighting that fire. Please, I pray, help our community. We lift that up in prayer to you that the havoc wreaked by those fires would be ended soon. We pray for your miraculous intervention. And I pray, Father, your blessing upon us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in thinking about our jobs, I'm thinking about excelling on the job. I wanted to communicate one of the more probably disturbing statements that ever Jesus ever communicated in one of his teachings, and it was during the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus said this, if someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Now, I want to give you a little background information to tie that into how that applies to our jobs right now. Back in Jesus' day, the Roman, the Romans governed and occupied Palestine, where the Hebrew people, the Jewish people lived. And here they had all of these rules that they were governing. They were occupiers of the land, and probably the Jewish people would resent any type of manipulation that was to go on by the Roman government. But they established this rule that if a Roman soldier would enlist the help of somebody, a Jewish person, that that citizen would have to pick up a pack that would have to do an errand demanded by the soldier. When Jesus was carrying his cross, for example, he was carrying that to Golgotha and the beating had taken a lot out of him. And a Roman soldier conscripted it's from Simon of Cyrene to finish carrying that cross of Jesus. And when a soldier demanded that of an individual, if he did not do that, he could be subject to abuse or arrest. Now, I've read that the Roman government instituted this law that only in cases of emergency that the Jewish citizen would only have to carry or do that duty for one mile. And I also read that the Jewish people had their homes there. They would mark a mile off in either direction so that they would not have to take one step further than going that mile. So here Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount. He's teaching and people are going, yeah, Lord, they love this new teaching of this new rabbi. And he says this, if somebody forces you to go one mile, go two miles with him. And they're going, what? And they did this double take. And they're going, is he serious? Maybe this is just something figurative that he's talking about. Is, is he being literal by that? That's aiding and abetting the enemy. What are we, no way, I'm not going to do that. But the principle that Jesus established then that still applies today is this. 
that Christ followers should be willing to do more than reasonably expected of them. Christians should be more congenial, more generous, more kind, more involved in their community, more in going out and doing extra on the job, more than anticipated. Even to those, uh, showing respect to those that have authority over us, those who treat us even poorly. And what a disturbing principle to say, go the second mile more than what's expected. And I think we put this principle at work at our jobs. Could you imagine the transformation of our culture for the cause of Jesus Christ in our land? If that's why people knew that. And at his first point, I want you to see that, that Jesus practiced the second mile principle on the job. Jesus practiced what he preached. And the Bible, in the first book, of uh, the first gospel, the first book of the New Testament, Matthew's gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You get in the middle there and you look at Matthew. We've been looking at chapter 14. If you want to turn there in your Bibles, we looked at this passage last week. We're going to read a lengthy portion of it right now. But it was a long day in the life and the ministry of Jesus on the job. And this on this particular day, uh, last week we talked about how Jesus was teaching and received word that his cousin and good friend John the Baptist was put to death. And his, John's disciples reported that to Jesus. And Jesus took a retreat from teaching that day. And he got in a boat. And he went across the sea. But the people had scurried around the sea just to be with Jesus. And when he landed, here was this great multitude of people that he'd already tried to get away with. And that had to be frustrating. But Jesus went to those people instead of sending them home in his grieving over John the Baptist. He taught them and he healed their sick. And I want to read and pick up where that story takes off in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, beginning with verse 15. The Bible says, Then as evening approached, after all this happened in the day of the life of Christ, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place. And it's already getting late. Send the crowds away, Jesus, so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. And Jesus said this, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Well, we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, he gave thanks. He broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about five thousand men, besides women and children. Now, there are a number of lessons that we can pull from this miracle of Jesus. That God can take the smallest gift and multiply it. That the feeding of the 5,000 plus illustrates Jesus' deity. That we can trust God for the future. It teaches us to be good stewards of the excess. But the point that I want us to hear out of this miracle today is that Jesus went the second mile. He did a whole lot more of than what was expected of him that day. And he spent the day ministering to the people. That was the first mile. But when Jesus did not send the people home and he fed the people, Jesus walked that second mile. He did a lot more than it was expected. And Jesus took that boy's small lunch sack filled with a little bit of food and he multiplied that. And he fed the people. That was the second mile. And when you examine the life and ministry of Jesus Christ repeatedly over and over again, he just didn't go the first mile, but Jesus consistently walked that second mile. In Matthew chapter 8, for example, just a little bit earlier than this passage that we're talking about, there was a leper there who cried out this, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. So here's this contagious leper who'd been set aside, isolated from his condition, spent time alone, had this, it's such a contagious disease that his family members and friends would not have been around him for some time. Just imagine he didn't even have the touch of his mother, the kiss of his wife, the hug of his kids, the pat on the back of a friend, because this guy has this leprosy and nobody wanted to get around him. But Jesus came and tended to this guy. Now Jesus could have healed him 
just by speaking the word. I mean, we read earlier about Jesus that he had healed a centurion's uh, servant by just speaking the words. He didn't even go to the location where the guy was. So Jesus could have said, be healed. And the guy would have been healed. But listen to what the scripture says. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the Bible says the man was cured of his leprosy. Jesus went the second mile in just touching the guy, giving him affirmation, giving him respect again, giving him love again. In John's gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the fourth gospel, the final gospel, in John chapter 4, it says that Jesus went through Samaria. The Jews didn't do that. They were half-breeds, so the Jews thought. But Jesus went through Samaria. That was the first mile. Jesus then had a conversation with the Samaritan woman at the, at the well. Then Jesus stayed two days in Samaria teaching them. And as a result, the Bible says that many believed that was the second mind. In John chapter 9, it relates that Jesus healed a man who was blind. That was the first mind. Then it says that this man, because of the healing and because of Jesus, they kicked this guy out of the synagogue. Although he did nothing wrong, somehow that offended them. This righteousness, this healing of Jesus. Jesus went after he heard that and located that guy and affirmed him. And it says that this guy believed and he worshipped Jesus. That's the second mind. In Luke chapter 16, in Luke's gospel, it tells of this guy, this tax collector, this despised guy, climbed a tree. And Jesus went the first mile and calling out this guy's name and said, come down, Zacchaeus. And Jesus went the second mile by inviting himself to Zacchaeus' home where it says that Zacchaeus household and many believe in Jesus. In fact, it transformed Zacchaeus' life so much that he gave half of all he had to the poor. I mean, Jesus' ministry, one incident after another, was Jesus walking the second mile and illustrating that principle for us. And the Bible says that Christ left us an example that we should follow in his steps. The Bible says this, and this was after Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Jesus said, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Think of the difference it would make in our world today if every one of us walked the second mile. What a dramatic contrast between that and the world, it's particularly on the job. Wouldn't it be dramatic if we all went the second mile? There are a lot of people, however, on the job who do just as little as they can I think they get by. Now, we're going to illustrate this with a video. This is an ancient video of Jack Nicholson in five easy pieces. And it kind of hopefully illustrates this point just a little bit. Let's play that. <coughs> Only what's on the menu. You can have a number two, a plain omelet that comes with cottage fries and rolls. Now I know what it comes with, but it's not what I want. Well, I'll come back and make up your mind. Wait a minute. I have made up my mind. I'd like a plain omelet, no potatoes on the plate, a cup of coffee, and side order of wheat toast. I'm sorry, we don't have any side orders of toast. Uh, English muffin or a coffee roll. What do you mean? You don't make side orders of toast. You make sandwiches, don't you? Would you like to talk to the manager? Hey, man. Shut up. You've got bread and a toaster of some kind. I don't make the rules. Okay, I'll make it as easy for you as I can. I'd like an omelet, plain, and a chicken salad sandwich on wheat toast. No mayonnaise, no butter, no lettuce, and a cup of coffee. And number two, chicken salad sandwich. Old butter, lettuce, mayonnaise, and a cup of coffee. Anything else? Yeah, now all you have to do is hold the chicken, bring me the toast, give me a check for the chicken salad sandwich, and you haven't broken any rules. You want me to hold the chicken? <laughs> now, I knew somebody would know what was happening. We, we had to cut it at the right point. But you know what? Some people, no matter what, just want to do the least they can do to get by. Toast it on the menu. I can't provide you toast. Nobody appreciates what I do anyway. Nobody does it either. You do it once and they're going to expect that 
about this forever. I heard about this kid who, who got a summer job painting fire hydrants for the city. And, and on that first day, he went out and he located six fire hydrants, cleaned them up and painted them. And one of uh, the, the longtime guys who worked for the city came to the kid and he said, look, he said, stop doing what you're doing. Don't do any more than three hydrants a day. And let me tell you, you do that, they're going to expect that from everybody. And the kid said that he followed what his co-worker said. But the kid could do, he could do three fire hydrants at a time in less than half the time that he was on the clock. But that's the way people are. Let's just do the least we can do. And I think it's true across the board in different lines of work. People just do just as little as they can to get by, I think. I mean, they watch the clock and they make sure they're the first one out the door. For on break time, they're the ones that's stretching out the break, taking it as long as it, if they can. Their sick days are the first ones who take all of their six days, and they only do what's just on that job description outline. They're not going to do one thing more. But Christ challenges us to be different, to walk that second mile, yes, even on the job. Listen to what the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians. It says, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. To, to mind your own business and to work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may want me win the respect of outsiders, and so that you will not be dependent upon anybody. When we go the second mile, we win the respect of our coworkers, or maybe the client, or the customer. But when we don't even do but just barely our job, you know what? We can lose the respect. And it doesn't matter how much you talk about Jesus or what your life's transformation is or what the invitation is to church. They're going to see your life as hypocritical. And you know what? That is the blame that the church gets today. You know what? The church is just filled with a bunch of talkers, a bunch of hypocrites. Jesus said, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And one of the most tangible ways to which let your light shine is to go the second mile on the job. Now, I think Jesus' example inspires us and challenges us to apply that principle on the job. What does a second mile principle mean specifically when it comes to our job? Well, one, it's doing more than expected. Even though it might not be part of the job description, I, several years ago, my appendix ruptured, and I spent five days in the hospital. Never had a hospital stay like that in my life, and, and don't you know really want to ever do that again. But I was in there five days, and what I learned was that there are a variety of different nursing styles. And there were nurses who would come in, and I know they would just do their job, and they'd never say a word. They were in and out. There were other nurses that came in, and they would pick up paper left behind. They would engage in communication. And there was my favorite nurse in the middle of the night when I started eating again. They would bring me crackers and ice cream. And she was great. But you know what? When it's time for the job evaluation by her superiors at the hospital, by these nurses' superiors, they probably, there'd be no effect by what they did or didn't do because they fulfilled their job. But that Christian who loved the Lord, who did things a lot different, than some of those other nurses. I think she's to be commended. The Bible says this, and this is kind of a key, a key verse of this entire sermon series, Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as if working for the Lord and not men. And whether you're a school teacher, that you're going the second mile and trying to help out a student, or you're a construction worker, and you clean up well when the job's done when you don't have to, you look at your server at the restaurant who brings the cup of cold water, refill without being asked. The stay-at-home mom that picks up the two kids and takes the lunch to her husband who's forgotten that, that is going the second mile. And that's making a difference. When they can get by, really, frankly, on a lot less. Robert Maddox wrote the book called The Christian Employee, and he said that God's arranged our lives that we would intersect with people on the job that we would never associate with otherwise. He said, we average 63% of our waking hours at work. That's 2,000 hours or more a year, 90,000 plus hours in a lifetime. And he said, God's arranged it that Christians' lives rub the shoulders of people who do not know Christ. 
that they would probably never associate with otherwise. And that's a great opportunity for us to witness. And when we go the second mile on our job, and we do more than what's expected, people notice. And people understand that the church is a place where Christ followers really get it done. Point B, what's a second mile? It's lending a helping hand when you see a need. There's a story in Reader's Digest once that told the story about how this lady was in a department store and she was looking for a cashier in one of those areas and she couldn't find anybody. She bumped into somebody with a name tag on and she said, hey, can you help me? I'm looking for a cashier. And the lady said, no, I can't help you. I'm in customer service. And she wasn't. She wasn't a cashier. But you know, every employee should be in customer service. Every employee should be willing to go the second mile and do those things even beyond the job description that are dictated there. Summer serve is coming up on 4th of July. We played that video and that explains this. Uh, it's not a Hawaii theme, but the 4th of July, do you, do you know what goes on in Pueblo West on the 4th of July? Wet and Yeah, is that what it's called? Wet and Wild and Willie Parade. There's this wet parade at the end of the parade I mean, this is an opportunity that thousands of people would gather in Pueblo West. And, and what happens after the parade, they've got this street all doesn't there's vendors, there's people selling things, there's a car show, there's all kinds of activities going on. Thousands of people going up and down this street. Well, what we do as the Oasis, in conjunction with the Chamber of Commerce, is that we do this carnival-like setting for the kids, where they can just have fun, and we give out prizes for that, and they have fun. And, but this is one outreach a year where we have probably the in, biggest impact that our church has collectively on the whole in our community to be able to share and be the church in our community for people to see Christians. And what we're doing this year is we're going to give away a couple of bikes, a few skateboards, and a couple of razors, and hopefully get some positive buzz because we want to go the second mile. We just don't want to provide the games and have kids having fun, but we want to know that we love them and go the second mile in trying to do that. Now last year we had the goal of, of having 75% involvement and participation with Summer Serve from our congregation because we need people to man those booths, we need people to hand out gifts, we need people to stand at the welcome counter, we need people working one, two, three, four hours that day in the hot, grueling sun for the cause of Jesus Christ. But last year, we had the goal of 75% God honored that with 77% participation. This year, we're looking for a goal of 80% involvement for people to get involved, to be able to be at the church in our community. So what we're asking is when you walk out, there's a red, white, blue counter out there, and that's why this is white, is uh, to get you signed up. And anybody who participates this year, we've never done this before, we're going to give away a free t-shirt so there's a perk so we can all look alike and you can see this sea of Oasis people out there serving in the community because we want to impress our community for Jesus Christ, to go the second mile so somebody will take notice and say, you know what, there must be something to that. And the thing of it is to get 80% People, there are so many people it takes just to have Sunday worship in this school. There are people who come here early and set up these chairs. They make the coffee. They set up the lobby area. There are people right now teaching in the children's area. There are dozens of people weekly on a Sunday. They give of their time. And you know what? They go the extra second mile and third mile and fourth mile when they commit their four hours or two hours or three or one on July the 4th because they understand the importance of lending a helping hand when it's needed and it's going far beyond what some of us want to do but you know what sometimes that's what the second mile requires so I encourage you guys to, to jump in and get involved with that and get to know some more people if you're newer with us but sign up today and just be a part and take the opportunity when it's given the bible says this be wise in the way you act toward outsiders make the most of every opportunity and when we serve like that Outside in our community, we fulfill a specific role that Christ has given to each of us when we do that. And you know what? Gratitude about your job is often the window by which your co-worker might see or not see the love of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, 
To walk the second mile, it's preparing in advance. Even when you can get by on the fly, it's doing your homework. It's make sure you know what's going on. A lot of people at their job can get by on what they know. But Jesus prepared in advance. Listen to this verse that Jesus told his disciples. Go into the city or into Jerusalem. And a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. He will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. He's going to eat the Passover. That's the last supper where that occurred. Jesus prepared in advance. He took care of the details. Now you might be knowledgeable enough on your job to get by, but you know what? You're going to be exceptional when you do your homework and you make preparations. And going the second mile means you do what it takes to get your job done with excellence. The UPS used to have training for their managers, and they would use this illustration at UPS, and they would go in and they would coach their managers to be as effective as they could. And uh, this illustration was from the Heinz Lumber Company. And Mr. Hines was once approached by this worker who didn't get the job promotion to management. And the guy was disgruntled. He came into Mr. Hines. He said, why didn't I get the job? Why did this other guy get the job? And Mr. Hines wanted to prove his point. And he asked the employee, he said, did we get any lumber delivered today? And the guy said, let me go check. He came back and said, yeah, we got a load of lumber this morning. Mr. Hines said, well, what kind of wood was it? Well, let me check. He came back a minute later. He says, number six pine. Mr. Hines said, well, how much did we get? Well, let me check. I'll be back in a minute. He came back. 3,500 board feet. That's how much we got. Mr. Hines said, that went on for a little while. Mr. Hines just said, look, go on in the, in the room adjacent to my office and keep the door open and just listen to this conversation. The guy went in and sat down. Mr. Hines called in the guy that he hired as a manager. Mr. Hines brought the guy in and said, said to the guy, hey, did we get any wood today delivered? And the guy said, let me check. And the guy came back and he said, yes, we did get some, a truckload of wood delivered this morning. It was number six pine. It came in on track three at 9.30 a.m. It totaled 3,500 board feet. The lumber was unloaded by 2 p.m. and stored in warehouse number 18. It was order number 6503 for the Williams Company. And its total value was over $16,000. And Mr. Hines said thanks and let the guy walk out. The guy walked in on his head low from the opposite room and said, now I understand why. Going the second mile means doing your homework, preparing in advance, and it's doing excellence on the job with learning what you need to do. Point D, the second mile is follow-up. One that's probably the most, the least glamorous part of any job is following up. I mean, it's exciting dreaming up the details, getting the plan in action, making the sale, but then following up to see if everything's okay. I mean, it just seems like you're wasting time, but a lot of times it's in the follow-up that people go the second mile. I mean, you call up, hey, is everything okay? Anything we could have done, need any other help? It's during those follow-up conversations that you gain loyalty and satisfaction on the job. Now, several weeks back, we are, we are right in the middle of about seven weeks under our connect groups. Dave Ramsey, right now, we're doing that two nights a week with a, with a group of people. And we were encouraging, encouraging everybody to sign up for this connect group. And at the same time, we had this church directory. We wanted to get everybody's picture so at nighttime we could just flip through and say, oh, Lord, bless him, bless him, all oh, that's who that is, and just see everybody's face. Well, that kind of came together at the same time. And we had registrations out there, people that, that signed up, and there were people who didn't. But what we did is we got every phone number out that we had. And, and we called people and we said, hey, we'd like to see if we can get you involved. We'd like to see if we can do this, you know, get you connected here, do the connection, get your picture taken. And uh, part of the conversation was, is there any way that we can pray for you and your family? Are there any questions that you have about the direction of the church, the future of the church? We answer those questions. It's amazing, just with those phone calls to everybody, of the positive report that came back to me about how exciting that was just to receive a phone call from somebody in church who cared. That following up, that making that additional connection is sometimes 
the point where things don't fall through the cracks, and particularly on the job, it's where loyalty is brought forth and you maintain harmony at your work and build your business. Point E, what's going the second mile? It's being sensitive to the leading of God. Even when you don't want to walk that second mile. You know what? It's sometimes Jesus that forces us to go the, four, the first mile. But we don't want to do the minimum for Christ, do we? We don't want to just let Jesus fall through the cracks. But going the second mile sometimes means that we follow through with Jesus. Doing excellence on the job even when we don't want to. Popular Bible speaker Beth Moore and goes about speaking at, at various venues. And uh, she tells a story about how when she was going to go to a speaking engagement, she's sitting at the gate waiting to, to catch a plane. And she's going over her notes trying to study those things for what she's going to say at that upcoming event. When she noticed sitting across right there at the gate, you know how intimate is, it is that waiting for an airplane. That this older gentleman was sitting there, kind of slumped over, unkempt, matted hair, nails, probably uh, like somebody who just hadn't been cared for in a while. When she sensed God saying to her, Beth, I want you to go witness to this man. And Beth will say, God, I, I'm studying for this. It's so close here. Wait, can you wait till I get on the plane? I'll witness to the old guy on the plane. And she said it's as if she heard the voice of God speak to her these words. I don't want you to go witness to him. I want you to brush his hair. Brush his hair? Lord, what are you talking about? I don't even have a hairbrush. You want me to witness to him? I'll go do that right now if you want me to witness to him, Lord. But brush his hair? What do you mean? Brush his hair. Yeah. She said, I could not focus on my notes. She said, I finally got up and I walked over to the man. And I said to the gentleman, Sir, could I have the pleasure of brushing your hair? What? Sir, could I have the pleasure of brushing your hair? Little lady, if you're going to talk to me, you better speak up because I'm hard of hearing. She said, She took a deep breath, knowing that stares were coming from every direction. She said, Sir, could I have the pleasure of brushing your hair? Well, yeah, if you want to, but I don't have a hairbrush. Well, I've got one in my bag. Beth Moore says she located the brush. She started brushing the guy's hair, sweat coming out of her brow, face red. She said it was as if in that moment that everything around me was gone. I was just solely focused on brushing this old man's matted hair. And she wrote this. I stood up and started brushing the old man's hair. It was perfectly clean, but was tangled and matted. I don't know, I don't do many things well, but I've had a notable experience in untangling knotted hair, mothering two little girls. A miraculous thing happened as I started brushing his hair. Everyone in the room disappeared, and it seemed that there was no one there except the old man and me. I brushed and brushed until every tangle was out of his hair. I know this sounds strange, but I've never felt that kind of love for another soul in my entire life. His hair, she writes, was fine and smooth. And I put the brush back in the bag and went around the chair to face him. And I got down and spoke for me and sir, do you know Jesus? And he said, I sure do. He said, I've known him ever since I married my bride. He said, she wouldn't marry me until I learned who the Savior was. And he said, the problem is I haven't seen my bride in so many months. I've had open heart surgery and she's been too ill to come and see me. I was sitting here thinking to myself, what a mess I must be for my bride. And Beth Moore said, that's a God moment that I'll never forget. And she said, when I was preparing to board the plane, there was this flight attendant that walked around the corner coming down there, screaming, tears streaming down her face. And she said, that guy out there, that guy, you brushed his hair. Why did you do that? Why did you help that old man? And Beth Moore said to the lady, you know Jesus, he can be the bossiest thing. <laughs> Following Jesus 
means going the second mile. Even when it's inconvenient. Even when you don't want to. Even when it moves you so far out of your comfort zone, you have no idea what you're doing. Somebody said, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. This poem's entitled, The Second Mile. The things you do for others, do not for your own fame, but give the glory to the Lord and in our Savior's name. An old gent who is lonely, someone whose friends are few, just to be the kind of friend of them that Jesus is to you. When finding someone who's depressed or one whose road is curved, you'll find the joy in serving, not in being served. So when God sends one your way in need, ask guidance from above, and give what help you had to give and do it out of love. So if you meet someone today too tired to even smile, just walk along and share his load and go the extra mile. And that's what Jesus wants to do every day. And you think about Jesus went the first mile, didn't he, when he left heaven and he came to minister on this earth, even during that hectic day, as illustrated in Matthew chapter 14. He went the second mile when he walked that Via Della Rosa to Calvary, to Golgotha, and hung on a cross and died for the sins of the world. And the question today is, every day, is Jesus walked the second mile? Are we willing just to take a few feet, a few steps for him today? And say, Lord, I yield to you. Father, we thank you so much for going the second mile for us when you did not have to, that you left the glories of heaven, your throne, to walk this earth, to teach, to lay forth a plan for your church. Father, each individual here today has a specific purpose that you've given to <coughs> us to be the church, not just to go to a place of worship, but to be the church 24-7, Monday through Saturday, yay, Sunday. Father, we spend so much time on the job. I pray that we could follow in your footsteps as you so grac grac graciously went the second mile and hung on that cross. Oh God, that we might follow you. If that requires baby steps today, I pray that we would hear you calling. If we know that our life on the job is a Yes. And we can understand why people point to Christians in the church and say, you guys are just hypocrites. I pray we can change that and make that revolution today in our lives and in our jobs. Father, I pray we can understand that you're with us, not just here now, but all the time. Let us live with that recognition. Let us be sensitive to your still quiet voice in our lives. Give us opportunities to speak up for you when we don't. Help us to serve when we think it's not our responsibility. Father, I pray today that there is one here that needs to take that next step, that they would do that, that they would meet someone in the back, stand up and sing, that you would impress it on their heart to walk back and meet one of us, that we could help them along the way to be your hands and feet. stand with us and say, let this time be reflective, but also a time to celebrate, to know that you're in.